Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the welcome to the BTS talk tonight. Um, and the topic for tonight is hydrophobic and pore blocking ingredient for use in tunnel construction. So I'm very pleased tonight um, to announce that we've got two speakers with us. Um, firstly, we've got Alistair McDonald. Alistair is the technical sales manager for Cement Age UK. He worked his way from technical assistant in 2010 to regional sales manager, and finally to the UK technical sales manager in 2015. And he has been involved in the use of integral waterproofers on hundreds of large commercial projects throughout the UK. He completed a university certificate in concrete technology from Derby University in 2012 and became a certified surveyor in structural waterproofing in 2016. Our second speaker tonight is Ken Howes. Ken Howes is the Associate Director of Cement Aid Middle East. Ken has been involved in the formulation, production, marketing and development of advanced concrete admixtures for over 45 years. After initial involvement running a London-based ready mix company back in the early 1970s, he moved into the admixture industry and joined the then Unilever company, Crossfields, which was responsible for the core mix range of admixtures and additives. Ken was appointed manager of the newly formed Cormix Middle East Venture and lived and worked in Daman, Saudi Arabia from 1977 to 1981. On leaving Saudi Arabia, Ken continued to work with Cormix in new ventures in Oman and Nigeria until 1983 when he joined Cementade and was the founder member of the Cementade UK company. Ken has been a regular contributor and speaker at hundreds of technical seminars throughout the UK, in Europe, Canada and the USA during his 37 years of service with Cementade, including the Concrete Society, the Cement Admixtures Association, the Institution of Structural Engineers and more recently to various ACI chapters throughout the Middle East, while Caltite has gained major acceptance in substantial infrastructure projects. So I now welcome our first speaker, and I hope you have a, a lovely, lovely evening. Hi everyone, I'm Alistair. Thank you very much for the introductions. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for giving us the uh, wonderful opportunity to present to the British Tunnelling Society. Uh, and specifically, David Caden, uh, John Cochran, Ivor, Divick, Kate, Charles Allen and Kath Coldwell, who have all at some point been involved in our email chains and have helped put this presentation together. And I'll now hand you over to Ken Howes to give the presentation. Thank you. Can everybody hear me now? Okay, getting straight on with our introduction. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Let's get straight on with the presentation. We've got quite a bit to get through and uh, not an awful amount of time. So the title of this is uh, Ever Dual Caltite System, or we'll keep the commercial out of it, a hydrophobic pore blocking ingredient for concrete. Moving on to the next slide, we're going to have a quick look at cement aid and who we are, first of all. So at a glance, you can see that we're, uh, we've got eight production facilities around the world. We've been 65 years using the same formulation of product. There's been no difference in, in, the, in the formulation of the product. We're in 32 countries. We've been involved in literally hundreds of thousands of projects. And we can proudly say that we've got zero defects in any of the projects that we've carried out across the world. Of course, we've had problems to overcome, but uh, no serious defects and, and nothing of any lasting consequence. Uh, I'm going to go straight into this one, tunnelling, specific waterproofing requirements. Now, usually most tunnels uh, are either designed to keep water and contaminants out, or they're designed to keep water and contaminants in, such as we would find in a, a sewerage tunnel. Sometimes we've got... Uh, oh, where's the slide gone? Forgive me, guys, I seem to have lost the slide.
This is a summary of a specification I came across out in the Middle East recently, and I'll just quickly go through it. The design should take into account the possibility of corrosive soil conditions which may occur and the effects of any water ingress into the tunnel and possible corrosion. The concrete should be designed for the lifetime of the tunnel without any coating, reapplication, or maintenance. That's a pretty tough call. Due to the very aggressive nature of the internal and external environment, the concrete should be highly durable obviously. And finally, that the contractor shall carry out a, de a detailed durability study to make sure that it achieves everything that uh, the client and the engineer wants from that uh, structure. So why do we waterproof underground concrete structures? So the function, obviously, is to separate the proposed activities from the underground elements, and especially water. All concrete gets wet. Unfortunately, when it does get wet, it just absorbs water and thereby any uh, contaminants that may be in that water, be it chloride, sulfates, or if it's an internal impact from the effects of sewage and what have you. That means that when you've got a dry, need a dry and durable performance, these concrete structures must be proofed against water penetration. So, first of all, we're going to have a quick look at the three basic mechanisms by which water can transpire through concrete. That's a, a pretty straightforward test that you do on concrete. The uh, standard test is uh, in detailed in BS 1881 part 122, where you just take a sample of concrete, dry it and immerse it in water, usually for a period of 30 minutes, and take it out and re-weigh it, and you measure the amount of absorption, uh, the, the weight gain. Secondly, there's pressure, permeability. Um, and that's tested by putting a sample into uh, into an apparatus to, to test it. We'll have a quick look at these. <clears throat> Absorption, that's pretty obvious. If you put water onto more or less any normal concrete, no matter what quality or how, what cement content, what water cement ratio, it will very rapidly absorb water. And this is an area of a, a broken concrete core where water has been put on there and very rapidly it soaks in. And so there is a test for this, it's BS1881. If you want to test the pressure, permeability of concrete, you use a rig something like this, where samples are put into, uh, are subjected to a head of pressure over a given area. And from that, you actually, they say you calculate the permeability. In fact, you don't, because in order to get permeability, permeability is a measure of water movement through a fully saturated medium. Um, these samples very rarely get saturated. What you do, you break them open after a period of time and just measure the depth of ingress. And there's a third uh, category here, water vapor, trans water vapor diffusion, which is a very, very slow process. It's interesting to look at which is the predominant mechanism of water, of water movement through concrete. If I tell you that absorption probably accounts for a, up to a million times greater movement of water through concrete than pressure. You might be surprised at first, but as I said, pressure permeability really is um, a measure of the density of the concrete. What takes over is straightforward absorption. That is the predominant mechanism of water through concrete. Why is this? If we look at a, a very basic mix now, it, it's actually quite a good co quality concrete. If we look at a mix with 400 kilograms of cement um, and a, a realistic water cement ratio of 0 0.38, so it's a very good quality concrete, that's going to tell us, if we do the calculation, that you add 152 litres of water. Actually required to hydrate that cement is considerably less. You need a water cement ratio of about 0.22 or 88 litres. So in this very good quality concrete, we've got a, a surplus amount of water, 64 litres in a cubic metre. During the hydration phase, that excess or free water will leave the concrete and it will leave in its wake a network of pores and capillaries, which are more or less interconnected throughout the whole concrete matrix. If you do the crunch the numbers here, you will find that 6.4% of the volume of this extremely high quality concrete is a network of pores and capillaries. And the thing that a capillary does very well is suck water. It's the basic mechanism by which a tree 
get water out of the ground through capillarity. So past attempts to prevent water getting into concrete and preventing any corrosion, always focus on the mechanism involved. If we look at the mechanism involved, you might try using, or typically we use barrier type coatings, membranes and surface repellents. If you're worried about uh, chloride induced corrosion, you might consider using epoxy or resin coated reinforcement. Uh, stainless steel, galvanized steel or other allied rebars, again, to try and cut down uh, or try and increase the resistance to um, chloride induced corrosion. Cathodic protection, another way, obviously, if, uh, if you just can reverse the current that's, uh, that's formed, you can switch off the, uh, the, 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 the damaging chloride induced corrosion. But it's a very costly thing to install and it needs a lot of monitoring. Another way is to use chemical cathodic protection, things like calcium nitrate can be mixed in with concrete. And what they do is basically they will absorb chlorides and form a, a material which is non-destructive. The problem with these is you need to calculate the, uh, the depth of potential chloride ingress over a period of time and put sufficient of this, uh, these, these different additives into the concrete to last for the projected life of the, of the structure. It's, it's quite a difficult process. Um, if you're worried about sulfate attack, of course, low C3A or sulfate resistant cement or blast furnace slag or other means of reducing the C3A. Very high strength concrete, high cement contents, um, will densify concrete, obviously, but they will do very little to actually prevent water absorption. Exotic mixes with blended cements, low heat cements, special, uh, secondary cement, cementitious materials. Again, all very helpful, but they don't completely solve the problem. Uh, if you're worried about uh, alkali aggregate reaction, um, perhaps importing very low reactivity aggregates in some cases, or finally, uh, accept the inevitable that chlorides are going to get in and have a very high cover to the reinforcing steel. Uh, the downside to that, obviously, the greater the, the, greater the cover, the more uh, it, the, the concrete is likely to crack. So, the big problem with membranes for a start, if we look at this particular detail, you've got uh, starter bars coming out of the, uh, the piling behind that membrane um, connected to the reinforcement. There's no way in the world that you can actually seal that properly and stop water getting through. Wherever you've got a surface penetration, you've got a potential problem with membrane waterproofing. Uh, some other Horror stories here, you've got trying to dress a membrane over the top of some very jagged rock and, and, and uh, it's very difficult to apply. Uh, it, essentially, it's, it's riddled with defects it's, and it's not really the fault of the membrane. Um, membranes these days are pretty good quality. Um, the big problem is the workmanship. Trying to completely wrap a concrete structure up in uh, some sort of membrane is very, very difficult to do it without any defects and without any holidays in the, in, in the, in the membrane, wherever you've got site uh, service penetrations, very difficult to install and potentially troublesome. So there's got to be an alternative. And what we're going to present here is HPI concrete. It's a, a, an alternative to, for membranes, delivering high design life, uh, membrane-free concrete waterproofing durability in underground concrete structures. If we look at the potential for corrosion, there are all they all have one common denominator. We'll go through there are eleven separate mechanisms that we've identified, and we'll go through them fairly quickly. But alkali silica reaction, uh, you require obviously a potentially a reactive aggregate in a highly alkaline cement situation. The catalyst for the reaction, however, is water. Free thaw damage, water gets absorbed into concrete and it subsequently freezes. Obviously, it causes expansion and breaking of the surface. A straightforward expansion from uh, wetting and drying cycles. If concrete is wet, it expands. If it dries, it shrinks. And if it's fully restrained, it can crack. Extremely high temperatures, if we have fires, particularly in, in tunnels, 
It's not the fire that actually damages the concrete to a huge extent. It's the moisture content of the concrete, um, which gets superheated as steam and can cause breaking and, and delamination of the surface. Uh, delayed etringite formation. Etringite is a, is a normal, natural part of uh, the cement matrix. It's actually a very useful product of, of hydration. But when uh, concrete is superheated, when it's um, being formed in perhaps in steam curing situations and what have you, uh, if the etringite doesn't get a chance to form naturally before the concrete hardens, but if it subsequently gets wet, it can cause expansion and cracking. Acid attack uh, is another one. Acids will attack, will etch many, many things, including steel. But uh, on the surface of concrete, it's not just the surface that's going to get affected. If the acid gets drawn in by suction into the concrete, it can damage it at depth. It can also lower the resistivity that you get around the reinforcement and the nice alkaline environment that normally exists. Chloride attack is one that everybody knows. Obviously, to get chlorides into concrete, you need the chlorides to be absorbed in water into the depth of the concrete down to the level of the reinforcement where the nice passive layer that usually exists gets broken down. Uh, we then need an anodic and a cathodic area, and to, they need to be linked together by an electrolyte, i.e. water. Uh, sulfate attack, a pure element of sulfur does very little to concrete, but if it gets damp, um, obviously it causes expansion and cracking of the surface. Surface spalling is caused when uh, salt water Chloride seawater, for instance, gets sucked into concrete. If it dries very rapidly, the water evaporates, the salt stays in the concrete. So the next time it gets wetted, it, uh, the salt starts, crystals start to grow and expand and break the surface. Galvanic corrosion, if we've got two different types of embedded metal, uh, then one will act sacrificially to the other. Even pure water is highly corrosive to concrete. It uh, decalcifies concrete and uh, it leaches the lime out of concrete and causes embrittlement. So there's 11 mechanisms of potential corrosion to concrete. And as I said, one common denominator, water. If we keep water out of concrete, not only do we keep our tunnels dry, but we stop every single known mechanism of corrosion. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of concrete corrosion that have, I've taken from one of my Middle East presentations. This is uh, a marine structure, a jetty in Abu Dhabi. Um, it's 11 years old. It's a pretty extreme situation, very, very high temperatures, up to 55 degrees there. But that's the result of wetting and drying concrete in, uh, in that sort of environment with very high, light, high, high salinity levels. Uh, um, around the Arabian Gulf. Okay, water ingress into tunnels. Um, the picture here on the left is uh, uh, a chamber which has been waterproofed by membranes. Um, and you can see there's various leaks, uh, quite a big puddle of water on the floor there. The problem is with the membrane, it is uh, on the back of that wall. There is no way of knowing where the leak is coming from, but it's finding holes and cracks to come out of and is uh, causing chaos inside that structure. Um, the one on the right, this is actually, that wall was reasonably well waterproof with a membrane. Uh, the roof top, uh, roof of the tunnel section was without a membrane, and basically water is just transpiring through the cracks, lateral cracks running across there and running down the face of the wall. They're both caused by membrane failure, essentially, and membrane failure is notoriously difficult to, to resolve. Another picture from my Abu Dhabi days, that this is uh, literally a seven-year-old basement when uh, with these photographs were taken. The, mem the waterproof membrane has failed, the water that's getting in there is highly saline. It's causing massive corrosion, uh, cracking, and general leakage in just seven years. So we'll have a quick look at HPI admixture. Um, the one we're particularly featuring is obviously our own product, is Caltech. But um, HPI, the, the term hydrophobic and pore block ingredient, was actually coined by Cement Aid and the Cement Admixers Association. When we first joined, they decided that uh, an, an admixture such as this couldn't actually be classed as an admixture because of the high dosage 
and high solids content. They said, no, it's an ingredient rather than an admixture. And they christened it HPI, hydrophobic and pore blocking admixture. So basically, yes, it's a, it's a thick, thick brown liquid, which is added to concrete. It has two major effects. One is to block all of the pores and capillaries, and the other is to render all of those pores and capillaries hydrophobic or water repellent. You can see this photograph on the right here. This is the effect of putting a droplet of water onto the top of HPI concrete. It just beads up and sits up on top. It's, it's like almost as if the there's a wax coating on there. It just will not get absorbed into the concrete. Uh, run this slide now. This, this is a brief explanation. So during the hydration phase, these are the capillaries that are being formed. The yellow lining here is the hydrophobic component, which reacts with calcium hydroxide and forms a, a nice water repellent coating. So when water lands on the concrete, it's literally repelled. If you subject that same concrete to a head of pressure, the secondary component, the pore blocker, is pushed ahead of the head of pressure and just a couple of millimeters below the surface it will block the physical, pull the physical block and, and block the pores and the berries. Water won't go past the block because there is no suction. So that's the hydrophobic component. Um, you I'm aware, I'm sure, of contact angle and how that affects wetting and drying and the pore blocking one, as we just explained. The additional benefits of using this HPI concrete, apart from the fact that it's obviously water repellent, um, if you look at a pretty standard test, the uh, BS1881 part 122 absorption test, this is usually done at seven days rather than 28 days, according to our specification anyway. Um, so that you've, if you've got any, any problems or any potential problems, you identify it very quickly after the, uh, the, the structure is, uh, is, is, has been built. Uh, very typically, you, the specification calls for less than 1% absorption in seven days, and very typically you'll get between 0.5 and 0.9. It, it depends on other factors, the cement content and the strength of the mix, but that, that's the general order. Of uh, absorption that you will get. Permeability, which I said earlier, is, is actually a measure of the movement of water through a fully saturated concrete, so you very seldom actually look at permeability in its true sense, but it's usually expressed as a, co a permeability coefficient, and the, the inclusion of an HPI will improve that by a full order of magnitude. A side benefit is the reaction between one of the components of, of H, this particular HPI and calcium hydroxide is actually an endothermic reaction. So it will reduce the heat of hydration by some 18%, which is very, very good in terms of potential for resistance to cracking. Another very useful thing, if we look at the tensile strength development, at 28 days, there's very little uh, to choose between the HPI modified concrete and normal concrete, but in the first three days, we literally see a doubling of the tensile strength above normal concrete. So again, that's very useful in looking at the potential of concrete to crack. Uh, most of the tests that we will show you, you you'll get literally 100% prevention of chlorides and sulfates uh, ingress into the concrete. There are various green building classifications, and obviously, by uh, stopping water getting in and stopping any contaminants getting in, you're greatly increasing the durability of concrete. This will have an impact on project time. Um, if you haven't got to install membranes, you're going to save time, you're going to save cost, operational costs, and you're going to reduce the labor of the content on site as well, taking one complete trade out of the operation. There are various uh, <coughs> certifications. Obviously, in the UK, we've got the BDA certificate, EC certification, uh, and from around the world, various certifications from the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia, where it's a standard specification for marine concrete in, by, from Aramco, the, the Arabian American Oil Company, and Singapore. Again, all of these uh, accreditations and many more and green uh, building standards. Uh, so just a, a 
a summary of the Aramco specification for marine concrete in the Middle East. Um, and they again refer to HPI system concrete. Um, again, it's, it's mentioning that it's a performance specification. They're not mentioning any product by name. But 30 minute absorption not greater than 1% measured by PSA unit 1 part 122 at seven days. Uh, and also, they, they stipulate a chloride permeability test, uh, total charge passed through not exceed 1,000 coulomb. Uh, what's interesting, the commentary notes at the bottom here, when HPI concrete is used, the following provisions apply. Liners and coatings are not required. There are no membranes, no coatings. No epoxy coated rebars are required. Uncoated steel bars are adequate. And things that the contractors love, backfilling can commence immediately after curing the concrete and the compressive strength has achieved 70% of the desired strength. So that could save an awful long, uh, an awful long time, uh, amount of time um, during construction. So we're going to look at some of the long-term research or some of the academic research, first of all, um, and just look at some of the benefits, independent uh, data that we've amassed over the years. So this is the first one I'm going to show you is the University of Dundee. Um, and what they've done here, they've taken some panels, which um, some incorporated an HPI, some are plain concrete. They're relatively thin, they're fairly modestly reinforced, and they're loaded in this contraption to actually bend them to almost a breaking point, and then they're put inside uh, an environmental chamber, um, sealed environmental chamber, where they're sprayed with warm salt water and dried out very rapidly uh, in a uh, cycle four times a, a day. This is a very rapid um, method of, of looking at the uh, potential for chloride-induced corrosion. Um, it's a ex very accelerated test. So that's, we would ask you to just have a look at the results of these tests because um, this is just a, a summary. Is uh, concrete structures with the HBI outperform all of those with all three points made by all available means. And um, bear in mind, this is this is. Uh, these are actual figures from the test, so this is accelerating test, and corrosion does not initiate in the structures with HBI extra until after about 26 years, compared with just six months for those with ordinary concrete. Then in the real world, we're not talking 26 years and six months, but you can judge from that, that's 52 times the, uh, the life of the normal concrete. Corrosion in, structure, in, in structures containing the HBI extra it only reduces the load carrying capacity of the structures by about 2% in 50 years. Uh, some research from Cradell in, in Singapore. This is looking at a 50 MPA tunnel quality concrete. Um, one question that I'm always asked, uh, uh, sort of anticipating I'm going to get asked about this, so I thought I'd bring this one up straight away. What if the concrete cracks? Well, that's a very good point. Most concrete will crack under some uh, situations, although, as we've seen, as I've explained, it's less likely to crack than normal concrete because of those other attributes. But these are reinforced um, samples of concrete, and uh, they've been artificially cracked, and then just literally immersed in water. You can see this is ordinary, ordinary concrete, and it's immersed in a shallow bath of water, and you can see just after three minutes how capillary rise has taken that water up into the concrete there, up to the level of reinforcement. Whereas the one with the HPI and the photograph was taken after 60 minutes, and there's no sign of any water ingress going into that crack. If we break the samples open, if it's split in half, you can see the sample without HPI is basically water has gone in through that crack up to the reinforcement. Um, so if we have two layers of reinforcement, they are connected by an electrolyte. So the sample on the right here, the, the sample with HPI, 
Um, you can see inside it is absolutely dry. Water may have gone into the crack, but it will go, it won't go laterally, it won't move sideways into the concrete. There's no way that it can act as an electrolyte leading out into cathode. Uh, you can see when the sample is broken open, you put a little drop of water on it here, it's immediately sucked in, whereas the one with the HPI, the water is just beating the soon like that. Uh, simple explanation, if water gets into a crack into in uh, concrete containing HPI, the water is retained in that crack. It does not radiate through the matrix, it does not link the anode to the cathode in normal concrete water, goes into the crack very rapidly and runs along the reinforcement. And that's really just a summary of what we've been talking about. Uh, it's a confirmation from CPI that uh, in this situation where you've used HPI, the cracks really don't matter. Um, I will make a copy of this available if anyone wants to read more about this or indeed ask me questions after this, or I can always send you uh, details of this particular test. When it comes to repairing cracks, if we've used a membrane and the membrane for any reason failed, also will try along the gap between the membrane membrane and the concrete and it will go find a crack if it's a through crack it will come out. So the normal procedure then may be to inject that crack and stop the leakage. But unfortunately the normal concrete water will transpire and even reach a crack which is not a through crack and you'll get another leak here and another leak here and you can chase this water around the uh, tunnel structure or a basement structure forever in a day if the membrane is failed because you can't actually find the hole in the membrane. Whereas if this is membrane-free, HPI concrete, if you've got a through crack, that is the only way that water can get through is a through crack right the way through the section. And it's very simply resolved by just injecting PU resin into that crack. So let's have a look at the comparative performance of HPIs. Um, and I'm not here to run any of our competitors down, but one that is very, very uh, well known, uh, crystal growth additives, for instance, these materials are added to concrete um, to reduce absorption or to actually improve permeability coefficient more than anything. Um, so this is a, some work that was done by the Road Traffic Authority in New South Wales and um, in Victoria, looking at the comparative performance between two different types of integral waterproof for concrete. What's interesting is if you look at the, uh, the material one, which was the crystal growth product, uh, they ran it through not just a, a normal absorption, but it was actually went through a series of wetting, drying, wetting, drying, wetting, drying, wetting, drying, etc. And if you look, the general trend is that it's getting heavier all the time. It's absorbing more and more water. So eventually that concrete will saturate. If you look at the HPI, on the other hand, the line is going down, so it's wetting, drying, wetting, drying, wetting, drying. And the line, you can see, is going down. Uh, this also transposed on here is another um, HPI, uh, another cement day product we call 3CC, which is a, uh, a use of a slightly lower dosage rate and slightly less expensive. And it's very, very similar. But the important thing is that line is going down. It's every dry cycle of getting is losing more water than it's reabsorbing over the next phase of the test. So this is a, a summary. So every your calotype or the HPI, full HPI, MPA, 50 MPA concrete, the reduction in water uptake is 92.4%. 3CC, which is the, the, the other product that we used at lower doses, 91.5%. Crystal growth products, on the other hand, um, another type of water product, which is 12.5%. Interestingly, they also looked at chloride penetration. You can see here uh, with the full strength um, HPI, we're getting 100% reduction in chloride penetration and 98.4% the, the second product. The crystal growth product does something, but it's 25.3%. So, uh, 
it gives you an, an idea of the uh, measure of improvement you can get with a proper HPI. The reason I mention this, there are the standard tests, as I said, for looking at water absorption is BS1881 part 122. And the test is normally done on seven or 28 day old concrete. A sample of it is dried out in an oven. It's weighed, it's then immersed in water, usually for 30 minutes. It's taken out and it's re-weighed in its saturated condition. And you measure the weight of water which has been sucked into that concrete. And you come up with an absorption for normal concrete, maybe two, three percent. But this is a situation here that I'd like to explain to you because the two concretes we're going to look at now are both so-called integral waterproofers. Both of them had a 30-minute water absorption when tested at 28 days of around 1%, or just under 1%. We thought it would be interesting to not run the sample uh, under underwater first 30 minutes. I mean, that really doesn't tell you too much about the, the, the life of the concrete and how it's going to perform in the structure. We thought it might be fun not to leave it in there for 30 minutes, maybe three hours or three days, well, hang on, well, let's leave it under water for seven days and actually see what happens. So the samples here, I'll run the little video now, um, they've been in that uh, water chamber there for seven days. Now, bear in mind, this is concrete which had water absorption of less than 1%, um, and they were put into these containers and left in there for seven days. <clears throat> uh, my colleague there was just showing that the water level had actually dropped in the container, so that water's gone somewhere. But this is an example of a, an integral waterproofer, which performed very, very well in the laboratory when tested in accordance with that British standard. Um, but it's a very simple test now just to break that sample open and see what has happened after seven days. just for a change in the sample there. And you can see there's absolutely no difference in the colour between the outside and the inside. It is completely saturated. That is so-called water repellent concrete. It passed all the tests at, uh, in the laboratory, a 30-minute test, but you can see if you put water on it, it's immediately saturated. You are actually looking at uh, permeability because that concrete is fully saturated now. The next one we're going to look at is, is uh, a calcite HPI, which has been underwater again for seven days. Um, my friend Greg there will just make a, a note that the water level hasn't dropped and uh, have a look at this one inside after seven days. This towel drying the surface. There's a small cup put in the sides of these. Uh, cylinders just to make them easier to break so they will remove the wet line on the inside of them and breaking it open. So you can see immediately <coughs> this, that concrete internally is absolutely dry compared with the other sample. Another very simple test if you actually put water onto that. See how it beads, sits up, is completely water repellent, even after being underwater for seven days. We've actually extended this test particularly for up to a year in our laboratories in Singapore. I didn't manage to get hold of any photographs, but uh, they're still doing the same after being underwater for over a year. Um, some work that was done by the CCCC, uh, Port Harbour Engineering Institute. Um, this is looking at exposure testing, uh, chloride induced corrosion potential. And uh, so this is the test site so adjacent to the sea here in a, in, a, in a jetty. And there are various zones under water at splash level and uh, sorry, in the inside of the zone and in splash level. 
And then samples of concrete placed in, in all of these, just in the different performance of different types of concrete. Um, the conclusion here, uh, after testing three years, the, uh, the samples, uh, which contain the hydrophobic blob, the ingredient, uh, we're talking about the massively improving corrosion performance and water absorption. Um, Fixing the HPI ingredient concrete can improve the anti-chloride corrosion performance of the concrete and reduce uh, chloride diffusions from composition of the concrete. Uh, mixing hydrophobic product ingredient in concrete can significantly reduce the water absorption. So this is after three years testing and the HPI environment. The actual measured absorption was 0 0.4 even after three years in that environment. Um, this is a summary that was written by uh, Brian Wardle, who is the chief engineer for Coal Products, which is a division of the now non existent uh, National Coal Wall. But they used to um, store elemental sulfur as part of the byproducts of the coking industry and it refers to some plinths that were placed under these so-called sulfate houses um, which were constantly being rebuilt after every two or three years even when they had a high build epoxy coating on them um, the epoxy coating would uh, if it had a small holiday somewhere even a pinhole um, the sulfate would Go through down through that uh, small holiday in the concrete, and would actually destroy the cement matrix from underneath the, the, the uh, coating. They used uh, cementate HPI in an experiment to actually rebuild part of the uh, coating works, uh, Avenue Coating Works sulfate house. And this is just really a summary with the epoxy coated concrete. A 300 millimeter section was completely destroyed in 12 months. Under the same condition, there was a maximum of two and a half millimeters surface loss after four years. That's a durability factor of 480 times that of epoxy coated mm -hmm. concrete. To give you an idea of um, this, something which will come home to uh, a lot of you if you're involved in sewerage tunnels, um, this is some, uh, an actual product that was a uh, product project that was carried out by South Australian Water looking at, they built a, a, an environmental test tank where they divert rubber sewage through this test tank. It's, you can see the rubber seal on the top and the put a lid on it's completely hermetically sealed. And they also introduced hydrogen sulfate gas into that end of the chamber to uh, really accelerate things. Um, normal concrete is put into there uh, just Factor and, and to pass SA Water's requirements, uh, it, it leads to uh, lose no more than 70 millimeters per annum. Um, the fact is that most concrete, they, they put normal concrete in there, they put coated concrete in there. It's a very, very destructive process. And very typically, these, this 70 millimeters of concrete is totally destroyed within about six months. What's interesting is the tank itself is actually built from cemented HPI concrete. And that's been in there since 2006. And these photographs were taken in 2010. Apparently, the tank is still there and it's still in use, but this is the last, last photograph I have of it. So, this is after four years. Let me just summarize that. So, the HPI Concrete clearly demonstrates a service life of 20 times that of standard concrete. There's maximum of 15 millimeters of surface loss, and yet that's in the worst in there where the hydrogen sulfur gas goes in. So something like 15 millimeters of, of loss after four years, as opposed to normal concrete lasting 70 millimeters being completely destroyed in six months. We'll have a look at some actual projects now.
Okay, so here we go again. The, this is a, one of the earliest projects we were involved with back in the 1960s. And this is uh, some pipeline supports running across the South Australian desert. It's in a tidal uh, salt pan area, so this, regularly, this area regularly gets flooded every time the tide comes in. Um, this white deposit you can see here is salt. Um, the, these chairs holding the pipeline are unreinforced. The original one is completely unreinforced, but this is what they look like after two years in service. This is sort of nice straight line here is about the limit of high tide or certainly the limit of saltivity of the concrete. Uh, what you can see at the bottom here is massive sulfate attack. You've got sulfates of 7,200 milligrams per litre in the soil and chlorides at 53,000 milligrams per litre, which has caused an awful lot of salt scaling. So this is what they look like after two years. And we were asked to come up with a proposal to try and repair them rather than knock them down and rebuild them. It's a uh, water pipeline running across the desert, serving uh, a few local communities. So it's very important to keep it going. And what we came up with was an idea of putting a, an HPI jacket around the old corroded chairs. Uh, one thing that the client particularly wanted to ensure was that we used the same quality concrete. There was nothing fantastic about it. It was about 30 MPA concrete. It was a 124 by volume mix. Uh, he wanted us to use the same mix, uh, but include HBI just so that we could measure the difference. We did ask that one of the old corroded chairs could be uh, left untreated so that we would have some way of going back and gauging the difference over the years in the press. So this was, uh, in 1962, we set about doing these repairs and putting the jackets on. So this is looking at the, I'll show you this one. First of all, this is something they did back in 1960 because of the sulfate attack. They tried sulfate resisting uh, type five cement, which really hasn't uh, fared too well. It's not a great idea when there are chlorides around any way to use uh, no C3 cement. But, uh, so that didn't work. But here's one of the jackets that was put around the old parade chairs. It's about 100 millimeters thick. So it's not a great deal of cover over that uh, old parade chair. And also because it's a relatively thin jacket, it is reinforced. There's, uh, there's a, something like an A393 mesh running roughly centrally there, so we've got a maximum of about uh, 50, 45, 50 millimetres of cover. It's the same mix, it's a 124 mix, but it's got an HPI added, and there's always going to be two years difference between the, the, the two samples here, but uh, you can see this one after 20 years is gradually uh, getting to the point where it's not doing an awful lot to support that particular section of pipe. This one, you can see actually salt water has spilled over the top and it's caused a stain here. And it's reinforced, remember, and there's not a sign of any corrosion, there's no sign of any sulfate attack. Um, it's still, still a pretty good nick. It's still got, it's got a few pop marks on it here, but that's eventually caused by windblown sand. So that's uh, erosion rather than corrosion. Uh, so coming up, we've got uh, after 40 years and 42 years, this was the last one standing of the uh, uh, the unprotected uh, chairs, and you can see the sulfate attack has got very bad, and the sort of scaling has got very bad. Uh, what was interesting at 40 years, they took some cores out of the corroded chairs and also out of the one protected by HPI. I took them back to the laboratory. The first thing they tested was the resistivity of the concrete. And the resistivity of the one containing HPI was 156 times higher than that of the control mix over here. Um, essentially, this was soaking wet, this was burn dry. The other interesting thing they noted from the cores when they uh, took them out, this cores went straight through one layer of reinforcement. And it was noted that the reinforcing steel was still in pristine as new condition after 40 years. And that is the latest photograph I have that's after 50 years. Um, concrete is still fine, still serviceable, no sign of corrosion whatsoever. 
Sir, in conclusion, then, the wetting and drying of seawater located uh, in extremely hostile soil conditions, normal concrete up to 75 millimetres was completely destroyed in two years. With Caltex, uh, the HPI system is zero appreciable deterioration after 50 years. So, yeah. so an infinite durability factor. As projects all over the world, I'll just quickly uh, highlight a couple that will be of particular interest as the harbour area treatment or has steam in Hong Kong, um, Changi wastewater retreatment retreat plant, um, Singapore MRT tunnels and stations. So we'll just look at a few of those. Uh, let's look at the HATS scheme, the Harbour Air Treatment Scheme. So this is taking um, all the storage from Hong Kong Island into the, uh, the preliminary treatment works. And then afterwards it goes through the tunnel under the sea up to Stonecutters Island where it goes for uh, secondary sewage to the actual sewage treatment works before it's discharged back into Hong Kong Harbour. Uh, that entire tunnel there and the access shafts are all containing HPI concrete. It's a mine tunnel through there. Um, to give you an idea, it's uh, something like 50 meters below the ground there. So that's a uh, detail of the of this scheme. Um, the access shafts there. Internal diameter of 65 meters and a depth of more than 40 meters. That's all HPI concrete, no membranes, no coatings. So that's a, a graphic to show the location of that tunnel and the sea bed. This is uh, a detail of the actual sewage tunnel. Mining, so it's, uh, it's um, excavated in the outer ring there, and the storage runs through the type L tunnels, which is like that, and the type K tunnels, which are uh, the one. So, <coughs> some photographs taken at the time, this is uh, pipeline stuff. For a kilometre between pumps, uh, highly uh, flowing HPI concrete is pumped through. The face of the uh, the works there, and uh, you can see that's the type L tunnel and the type J and K tunnels. So this is where the L tunnel and the tunnel tunnel. And this is all HPI concrete. No membranes used there whatsoever. Close up of some of the uh, injury operation. The big problem with tunnels, it's quite interesting that it's been noted. I, I was actually questioning on this uh, some time ago in the Middle East, looking at a, a road tunnel there where the internal reinforcement had uh, badly corroded and the big lumps of concrete were falling off into the road. Um, the engineer in charge of it was surprised that it was the internal reinforcement that was corroding and not the outside reinforcement because they knew the membrane had failed and groundwater was getting through the tunnel. Well, basically, just to simply explain that, groundwater is going into the tunnel containing chlorides. Uh, it's diffusing through the concrete, penetrating through the concrete until it reaches the dew point, which is uh, just at the face where it evaporates, it evaporates into the inside space of the tunnel. Um, it's also sucked through with there's a piston uh, effect of traffic going through the tunnel. What then happens, the water evaporates, but the salt stays in the concrete and will slightly will, will start to diffuse back to that inside reinforcement, and that is the one which will corrode. Um, it's a quick schematic of Singapore's MRT system. Every uh, station there where you can see our company logo, 
that is completely waterproof using HPI concrete without membranes. So there's a few more to add on to that. I haven't got the complete up to date list, but you can get a, an idea of the number of underground stations and tunnels in the world and MIT. And here's a close up of one um, station box. There's the tunnel coming out here, and this is where most of the calcite has been used, or most of the HBI concrete is in the station boxes themselves. This is a typical section. This is the Changi Line and or C5 C504 for it. Um, I don't know, they've used normal concrete and just a 300 millimeter topping of HPI concrete. That's all you need to protect it. It doesn't matter if the under, under, underlying concrete gets saturated, it really doesn't because there's no evaporable loss up through the HPI layer. Um, the thick, thick section walls here are with the product 3CC, which is, is a use of a slightly known as dosing tree, and the top of the slab is, uh, is HPI concrete, it's 300 millimeters. Uh, this is another uh, MRT station, which is a tunnel in the Singapore River. Um, it was cut and cover, it was built inside coffer dams, but here you've got a uh, ground pH of down as low as 2.3. And the, uh, that tunnel has been in operation now since 1985. Never had a leak, never had a pump, and that's membrane, entirely membrane free. Singapore Mass Transit System again. This is uh, the use of HPI concrete against the diaphragm wall. It's eliminating a, uh, one complete trait of the uh, need to install a membrane, that creates an additional space inside the, the uh, structure as well. A couple of finished pilots, projects, um, different sections of uh, the MRT, all protected with uh, HPI concrete up to 30 metres below, uh, below the water table and uh, no memories whatsoever. And a close up of uh, this is an interesting one actually, not C903, the MRT tunnel, and particularly uh, potentially troublesome. Um, Okay, so the, the, the top of the, uh, the roof there that was uh, all, all constructed with uh, tubular piles and piles placed across the top of the to support and these king beams uh, to support the, the tunnel. The whole thing was cast, the top of the slab, the self-compacting concrete containing uh, HPI, the walls were cast with uh, HPI concrete and the roof because there was no way they could put a membrane over the roof, it was just pumped in and soaked up in concrete and it's completed the tunnel box. Ah, uh, here's a, a bit of a, an idea of how do you attach your membrane to this sort of thing, tube the piles. And the answer was, as I said, to, uh, to shore the whole thing up. Originally, they were going to shotcrete it and apply a membrane to the shotcrete, but uh, they found on, on the collection that it was quicker to actually, actually uh, shuttle the whole thing up and use flowing concrete everywhere. It's, the other line is there, is the HPI concrete. The internal walls don't need to waterproof. And to give you an idea, this is the completed section here. This section here is the uh, part that was done using a membrane. And you can see there's a lot of water egress even now. There's been a lot of repairs done there as well, but uh, it's, it's still leaking. And this is the section with HPI without a membrane. As you can see, it's blown dry. Services tunnel in Fujian, so we're going 20,000 cubic millions of concrete there, it's 10 meters below ground and adjacent to a lake. Um, Caltite or HPI can be used in, uh, in shop creek. This is a uh, bridge that compares to a, a bridge in, uh, sorry, a tunnel in uh, Colorado, uh, where during the winter they get these massive icicles forming on the inside of the bridge. 
Um, if they fall and hit a car, they can actually cause a serious amount of damage. And uh, this whole Bear Creek tunnel was shot through with HPI, and it was absolutely done dry as well. Um, with shot creed, it's obviously very dependent on the uh, ability of this guy here, the nozzle man, to uh, actually do that job properly, make sure the concrete is properly compacted and there's no voids and other steel, etc. Um, <clears throat> here is an example of where you've got a king post, which is normally that would that be a, a bit of a problem for uh, trying to wrap a membrane around there. But essentially, um, what we do is put a, uh, a joint strip, an uh, expanding joint strip around the perimeter of that uh, HP, uh, uh, HP, and cast it in. It's then cut off, and that is it. It's very, very simple. There's no uh, messing around trying to put infills around the uh, and uh, join up <coughs> the membrane. So there's a quick description of it. So it's this is the uh, hydrophilic joint strip it's wrapped around the pin post. Um, after completion, this is cut off, and the gap is the top of it is filled with uh, a non shrink route containing uh, an HBI additive. This is an interesting one, the essential one, one giant bypass in Hong Kong that was constructed in 2014. It's a tunnel that runs from the west of the central business uh, area of the district of Hong Kong, uh, past um, the area of Wan Chai and comes out at the eastern end of Wan Chai Central. So the idea of this uh, bypass was to relieve the traffic in, uh, through the business area of Hong Kong. There's one particular section which is almost, as you can see, pretty adjacent to the, uh, to the convention centre there. Uh, where uh, this the, the uh, bypass tunnel had to run literally over the top of the harbour tunnel of the mass uh, transit railway, and the engineers thought it was rather too difficult or perhaps too dangerous to uh, do that in a conventional way. So this particular section was precast and floated out. It's all in HPI concrete. There's no membranes or coatings on it and it was sunk into place and connected up to the USB tunnel. There it is being dragged out and sunk into the location in the harbour. Uh, <clears throat> this is the drawing from uh, showing the actual design and everything here you can see in blue colour is HPI concrete. No membranes and no coatings used whatsoever. And that is a subsidy problem. Uh, quick look at the performance specification um, for membrane free waterproof concrete and corrosion proof concrete. Um, this is uh, a generally accepted uh, generic specification, um, performance specification. Uh, its main content shall be no less than 335 kilograms. Um, if you use blended cement, PFA, blast furnace, slag, or silica fumes, there are many modifications to that, but this is a straightforward um, type 1 cement. Export cement ratio should not exceed 0.45 or 0.42 if you're in a acidic or salt environment. It, is important here this, this particular control contains a time proven effective HBI, providing a corrective 30 million water absorption not greater than one percent tested in the course of the SAE one, uh, but the test is done in seven days rather than 28 days. And this is a very important consideration. The HBI used must have an independently verified record of successful use in the field of not less than 25 years with no seepage, reinforcement corrosion, or diminution of effective absorption. That point three is so important. As I said, there are a lot of uh, so called integral weapons of concrete that will work extremely well uh, when tested in a laboratory and will pass this. BSOD one part one two two, 
because um, they won't necessarily do that for uh, much longer than a few hours if, if, if you look at the, the way the test is done. So, um, just to summarise really, it's, it's no coating, no membranes, no cathodic protection, no exotic cement lens. If you would like to know more about this, uh, go to www.cementa.com or the UK site, cementa.co.uk. Uh, you can also pick up uh, all of the projects around the world that Cementa have done looking at this uh, data online here. I can be contacted at this address or Alistair at this address, uh, telephone number. And so we'll, we'll leave a copy of this available for the to look at afterwards. So going back to tunneling specific requirements, you remember that first slide that I brought up, the design should take into account the possibility of corrosive soil conditions, the effects of uh, ingress of uh, nasty from sewage tunnels, etc. And I think you'll agree we took that box. The concrete should be designed for the lifetime of the tunnel without any coating of the operational arrangements. So we've looked at some pretty extensive real life examples over 50, 55 years, and it's still working absolutely fine. So we took that box. Due to the aggressive nature of the internal external environment, the concrete should be highly durable. We've seen that up to 52 times the durability factor of the more concrete. And the contract should carry out durability study. Well, as I said, there are lots of ways you can do durability studies. I don't think there's any laboratory tests that you can do which you can do definitely say that this concrete is going to last for the life of the structure. There's all sorts of tests we can do, but the real test is the test for time, and I think we've demonstrated that one. So thank you very much for your very kind attention, and uh, I'll hand it back to uh, back to you to ask, ask any awkward questions. And Alistair, I need you on board to answer them, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think Jimmy is going to move us for. Yeah, I think I've just I've just muted Ken for a moment. I think we're going to have to play. Um, I think we can now see the screens. I think we've got a couple of questions in you in, in tonight for both of you. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. I think for me that very much showed that the, the ability to see over time um, the real value of being able to see see the evidence firsthand there. So I think if Divik is able to share some of the questions, um, we've had a few in already on YouTube. And then I think if we each mute and unmute ourselves when it's um, between the two of you to talk, that would be great. No problem. Fantastic. So what I might do is if I could ask due to the, the feedback we're getting, if you could read out the question and then um, either one of you answer, that would be fantastic. And if, if Ken, you could unmute yourself if you're going to answer and vice versa with Alistair. Thank you. Would you like, sorry, would you like me to ask the first question? That would be lovely. Thanks. If it's easier, don't mind. Yep. So I can see the first one there from, from Divic. Um, does HPI performance differ between plastic versus steel fibre reinforced SCL? Ken, would you like to answer that question? So you, you just need to unmute yourself, Ken.
can hear me now? We can hear you, Ken. Okay, so does the system endow the concrete with any self-healing abilities? Well, all, all concrete will self-heal. Um, there's always uh, a, a surplus of, uh, of calcium hydroxide available even in, in, in all hardened concrete. If it gets wet, um, it will self-heal. Uh, I think that probably the, the question emanates from uh, one particular type of admixture which we looked at, which is uh, the crystal growth one, and the, and the manufacturers claim that uh, if you get cracks in concrete, they will magically self-heal if they get wet. But all, all concrete does that. All concrete does that. Let's put it this way, put it another way. If there's a tiny crack in an HPI, a proper HPI concrete, uh, it, it will self-heal. It will self-heal nine times out of ten. If it doesn't, it gets injected. And Ken, could you answer the first question again as well, please? Uh, uh, okay. Does HPI performance differ between plastic versus steel fibre reinforced SCL? Okay, yeah, um, happy to do that. No, it, the performance, there's no difference in the performance. Obviously, what uh, HPI is doing is, is addressing the, uh, the function of the cement paste. It's making it hydrophobic. It doesn't have any, the, the type of reinforcement paste doesn't really come into it. It'll work with fiber reinforcement, plastic or, or steel. And Ken, we've been, uh, we've been given a, a curveball here. <laughs> That, that's a very good one. That uh, requirement for 25 years proven use, that, it's not a cement aid um, requirement. It was actually one that was introduced by Aramco in Saudi Arabia, uh, which we, uh, and the reason that they, they adopted it was they had basically tried so many things. Um, there was uh, one particular structure that they built which is literally 30 cubic meters of concrete, but it was supporting a catalytic cracker. Um, and the whole thing was epoxy coated. And after about 15 years, um, they'd used a mixed design that was, they were told would, uh, according to the, the chloride diffusion, uh, diffusion characteristics, it was gonna last at least 75 years. In fact, it lasted 15 years, even with a coating on it. Um, with the result that that catalytic cracker had to be shut down while they did maintenance, which was costing literally millions of dollars a day. Um, the requirement for 25 years track record, as I said, was Aramco. They said, well, we're, we're, you know, we've tried epoxy coated steel, we've tried high levels of GGBS and silica fume and all. we tried all these things they really haven't worked we were promised they were going to work so we're going to put this stipulation that it's got to have at least 25 year track record so um, yeah the next one uh, I hope that answers the question has the system ever been used with shock creep? Uh, yes it has um, as I said the when we looked at the uh, Bear, Bear Creek Tunnel in Colorado that was uh, uh, shotcrete. Um, it really depends on the, or the the, the uh, efficacy of, the, of, of that. Really depends on the skill of the nozzle man. Um, it's not like placing normal concrete or even self-leveling concrete these days. It does require a, a, a fair degree of expertise from the, the nozzle man. But yes, it has been used. If it's properly placed and there's no voids behind the steel, it will work beautifully. Um, Alistair Smith, has HPI been considered for use in nuclear projects? Um, yes, it has been considered, um, and in fact we are in the throes of actually doing some more development work um, with a European consortium at the moment. This is something that I got involved with just a couple of days ago. Um, it hasn't, to the best of my knowledge, been used in any nuclear projects in the UK uh, or elsewhere around the world. But uh, I know one of the concerns from this European consortium has been looking at the durability of concrete. Um, the fact that there are nuclear projects really doesn't alter the basic mechanisms of corrosion that we looked at, those 11 mechanisms. They will occur whether it's a nuclear project or not. 
Um, we do know that um, certainly radiation won't have any effect on the components of caltite. We had that checked out when we were talking to the people of Sellafield many years ago. Um, how do you fix the portion of DTO or booby flying that was leaking and hadn't used the HBI? Um, to be honest with you, I don't know. Um, <laughs> How do you fix the, the bit that was leaking and hadn't used HBI? Um, it was the membrane that failed, not the concrete. Um, and really, this is the, the, the nub of the, the problem. If you use a membrane, it's behind the concrete. You can't actually see where the leak is. So you, you, you can um, inject cracks, you can inject honeycomb areas where you can see water coming through, but you're not actually fixing the hole in the membrane, because you can't see it, you can't find it. And that is the, the, the age-old problem with membranes. Um, so, it, it, short answer to you, uh, Marika, I, I don't know how that, that area was fixed. The contractor must have fixed it somehow, I guess. Uh, I've even seen situations where they'll build a drain and, and then drain the excess water away, but um, I don't know. Okay, next question, has the concrete quality has the concrete quality of the corroded concrete in the sample been verified to be within specs? Um, corroded concrete in the sample is verified. It's, it's, I'm not sure that I follow that one. Um, the concrete quality of the corroded concrete in the samples has been verified to be. Uh, which project are we talking about there? I really don't know if you could come back to me on that one. Um, Okay, let's move on to the next one. Then. Uh, okay, there was mention of mixing the additive for grout. Has there been any laboratory testing for this? And if so, what time frames? Is is it performance similar to performance to concrete? Absolutely. Yeah, the um, the station boxes uh, where it joins the, the tunnel is all grouted up. We use a, a, a non-trend grout, um, and that has an HPI mixed in with it. Um, you, in terms of the absorption characteristics and the permeability characteristics, very, very similar to, to concrete. In fact, can be even better than, uh, than concrete if you use a, a, a really high strength ground. And I'd like to answer the other one about uh, has the concrete quality of the corroded concrete in samples been tested, but. Uh, Do we have any uh, any further questions? If someone wants to uh, sort of highlight this one, ah, I can't remember the project name. It was one of the ah the pipeline. Okay, um, you're talking about the corroded concrete in the pipeline. Um, the cores that were taken showed that the concrete was, uh, as you saw, the surface of the concrete had badly corroded away. I don't think they bothered to do any strength testing on it. Um, essentially, it was uh, it was shown away anyway. Um, the calcite or the, the HPI of concrete, the, the things they were most interested in, the work was actually done by Taywood Engineering um, on behalf of uh, the Water Authority. And the thing that they were particularly interested in looking at is why one concrete had corroded so badly and why the other one was still in great condition. So the things that they looked at were chloride ingress, um, condition of reinforcement and uh, sulfate attack and what have you. So there was a comparison between the two, but I don't think there was any strength testing done. Um, in terms of the, the, oh, was the concrete actually verified to be within spec? Um, yeah, I think they, they, they were able to measure the cement content, which was, um, as I said, it was a pretty low-tech concrete in the first place. There was nothing spectacular about it. It was uh, around 28 to 30 MPA, I think, and that's all it was designed to be. Um, so I don't think there was any problem with the way it was uh, built in the first place. Uh, the reason that uh, it's so impressive is that it's the same mixed design, but with HPA in it. So even in a very low quality concrete, you still have that massive improvement in durability. 
Can this system be used as a brush or spray on thin coating? No, sir, I'm afraid not. <laughs> it's for use in structural concrete. Yes, if we could have a any final question. I think if that is all within the chat. Okay. Would like to remind my Just like to remind people that you can um i am sure that alistair and ken would be interested in taking further comments so please um leave comments within the live chat and we will make sure that we get back that they get back to you um and also you know that you can contact us um via our facebook and twitter and email addresses for the british tonic society so I really want to um, give a big thanks tonight to both Alistair and Ken for giving up their time this evening. I thought that was a very interesting and informative talk um, and really pleased to see lots of good questions in the chat tonight. So I think if we're, I think we've had a few feedback issues, but I think if, if, if there are no more questions, Divik, um, we move on to the chair's slides. Thank you very much, Kate. Really appreciate that. And thank you, everyone at the BTS. Thank you. It's been very enjoyable having you this evening. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Oh, if you if you stay on for a moment, you might be interested in the definitely the first slide we're about to show. Absolutely. So just a, a quick one, quick one tonight. If we could move to the, the first slide, I've just got a couple of announcements on behalf of the BTS about some of our upcoming events and one event which will be happening in about five minutes time if we move to the next slide. Not a problem. Okay. So um, just a couple of announcements for tonight. Um, we actually have our next part of this evening. Normally um, we'd be inviting you all to join us um, in our bar after our talk where we, where the, the speakers will then usually be on hand to be able to answer any questions. So tonight, if Divik moves to the next slide, we are trialing our first BTS virtual bar. Um, I'm afraid it is a, it's very much a bring your own event tonight, um, but it would be really good, um, total trial and error, um, to get people to join this link. I've been informed by people far techier than I am that if you scan this QR code, it will take you straight there on something called Linktree. But for others of you, if you follow some of this link, which should have also been emailed out to everyone, um, and it is also, is this link on our YouTube, I think, also, Divik? If, you, if, you're, if you're somebody that doesn't know how to scan a barcode, um, can we just put the link in the chat? Just, I think we'll put it in the chat so that those of you here can find it. Please um, feel welcome to come and join. Um, we're going to see how it goes and look at what more we can do for some social interaction events. Um, after some of our evening meetings um, based on some feedback we've been having. So that's that one. Hopefully you can join. If we move to the next slide, I've got a couple of other announcements this evening. So the next announcement is on behalf of the BTS Young Members Committee. Application for members are open now. Um, so get your applications in. Um, 
you will see that they're announcing the new steering committee members and Divik, who's been very good at um, helping with organising a lot for this evening, um, is the new incoming chair. So get your applications in. Um, the deadline is the 12th of October. And again, if you follow this um, QR code link, that will also provide you with more direct information. So the next one. So the next um, BTS event is actually the BTS Young Members have got a joint BTS YM TAC YM joint lecture on lessons learned as a trench list litigation expert and designer. And that is on the 28th of September. So please um, subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, join us for this event as well. So if we go to the next one. Um, so the next BTS event is on the 15th of October and that is on the Greenwich Tunnel Boring Machine Delivery, the abridged story. So I hope you can join us for that one as well. And that starts at six o'clock. So the other part was just a little bit of an update on the BTS at 50 book. Many of you that join us um, each month will know that this has been progressing at great speed. So our plea is we're, we're still, it's making great progress, but we've still got progress to make. So please, um, if you've got stories to share or things um, in particular, photographs to share, and I think if you keep sliding through the, the slides, we'll capture all of it, that would be fantastic. Um, so this is some of what it's going to look like. Um, the plan is still, we've got a lot of the, the layout largely complete, but we are needing still a few more in particular photos. So please um, send them in to us um, so that we can achieve this deadline and um, help celebrate our 50th anniversary next year. So if we keep, keep sliding through. And if you've got um, anything, please contact Ken, Sarah, John or Anita. Um, and if you've got any ability to help, and also um, if you are keen to sponsor, um, you will get your company's brand in front of all levels of tunnelers, um, and that will be on the book for forever. And in particular, it will be all over the back cover of um, what many will say is the biggest selling BTS book ever. Um, we still need volunteers and sponsorship to help finish the job, and it would also be really good to be able to share your stories within that book. So thank you for that. And I think there's just one more, and this is just a general reminder. Um, it's been really great to see um, our attendance at so many of these meetings, um, getting fantastic levels of interaction over YouTube. Please can I remind people to subscribe to our BTS YouTube channel. Um, you can, the lectures are streamed live and are available to watch soon after, but if you subscribe, you will never miss a lecture recording. And in addition, as I noticed um, during the talk, and I meant to mention it, that Ken has offered, though I think there was a paper you were wanting to send some links to, we can get those links into the chat here so that they can be shared for everyone to be able to see. So if you subscribe, you'll always be able to get that information. And thank you very much again to all our speakers for all their offers of help with all of that this evening. So I think that was my last slide. So I just want to say um, a quick thank you for me. And that leads very nicely into um, hopefully many of you will be able to join us in the virtual bar. And we would love feedback on any other events or things that we can try, try to do. So um, good night from me and thank you very much.